there's something that's happening in our culture that's yes. not sitting right with you. Okay, yeah. how do you defend the damn culture against it without making the claim that we do have something of, let's say, higher value that is the consequence of following a particular tradition? Yes. Because without that, you lost, you lose the argument instantly. Indeed. On what possible ground can the moral relativists defend their own culture, given that they reject that their culture is objectively good? How can they possibly condemn the misconduct of other cultures if they don't believe there is a universal categorical conduct to live up to? Does not the disease of nihilism render one morally impotent? This is the central claim we're going to investigate in this video, but first, let's get some context on the table. Earlier this year, Jordan Peterson had Stephen Fry on his podcast to discuss a variety of topics in the realm of drama, literature, mythology, and politics, with particular emphasis on atheism, religion, rationalism, empiricism, and morality. It was, by my lights at least, an exceedingly interesting and fruitful conversation between two very intelligent people engaging in a respectful and constructive manner. At the time of watching it, I immediately wanted to weigh in on a few things. For instance, Jordan expressed that he's skeptical, let's say, of the atheist skepticism. Since the atheist skepticism, or at least the skepticism embodied by the Four Horsemen, is entirely destructive, containing no redemptive element. And I have to say, I think he's broadly correct in this assessment, which in its own right could do with an expansion. But since I'm not yet sure on how many videos I'll make in relation to this conversation, and to which the answer, I must admit, will depend on how well received this video is, I want today to focus on a divine response by Fry to the charge of moral relativism. So let's begin by attempting to still man the objection. So let's say we're going to defend the values of the West. Mm -hmm. To the degree that they're worth defending then we are making a claim that the inheritors of a particular tradition have something valued, valid morally on their side, or we cannot defend that position. There's something that's happening in our culture that's yes. not sitting right with you. Okay, no. how do you defend the damn culture against it without making the claim that we do have something of, let's say, higher value that is the consequence of following a particular tradition? Yes. Because without that, you lost, you lose the argument instantly. So when it comes to morality, I have a tendency to open with Immanuel Kant's categorical and hypothetical imperatives. And the reason for this is because this distinction quickly dispenses with much of the confusion around moral statements. A hypothetical imperative is something that we ought to do on the condition that we hold a certain goal. For instance, we can say, if you want to increase human happiness, then you ought not murder. But if someone doesn't hold the goal of increasing human happiness, then this ought statement is unfounded. Whereas on the other hand, a categorical imperative is something that we ought to do unconditionally, without reference to any goal or end. For instance, you ought not murder. And the dialectical stance that Peterson is referring to is that since the religious, for instance the Christian, are convinced that they have categorical imperatives, that is, in the form of immutable and eternal commands issued by the Almighty, they are able to object to the actions of non-Christians in a way that the more relativist can't. Whereas the Christian can say to other individuals and cultures, you must do X, or you must not do Y, since to fail to do so is to violate God's categorical moral law, the relativist can only appeal to hypothetical imperatives. They can only say, if you want X, then you ought to do Y. Hence, the religious, or anyone who believes in categorical imperatives, have something off let's say, higher value. And it's only because of this, so the argument goes, that they can truly defend their own moral actions, or indeed object to the immorality of other individuals and cultures. Now, there are many approaches to this charge, but here we're going to focus on Fry's, which we'll break down into three segments. Here's the first. Because without that, you lost, you lose the argument instantly. Mm. I, I, th I mean, I think a lot of it is to do with the, uh, the, the, the necessity that we, we all have of redefining it. We have to remember that morality is, is a question of manners. It is literally what morality means, that our parents and grandparents had a very, very different and very firm sense of what was immoral. If the word immoral was used in a newspaper or by a person, then that person's immoral it would have a sexual meaning. It would mean that they lived with someone with whom they weren't married, or they lived with someone of the same sex, or that in some way they, they were philanderers or loose in their morals, meant entirely to do with the bedroom. These were the unforgivable behaviours of 
a generation that close to us. We can still hug them if we're allowed to in the garden in COVID times. That that's how quickly morality changes. So the idea of the culture is a false one. There is no the culture. So Fry's approach here is unconventional in that rather than explaining how a moral relativist can critique themselves and others, he simply denies the crucial and implicit premise that the religious possess categorical imperatives. That is, even if it were the case that, say, Yahweh issues objective moral commands, it doesn't follow that we have eternal and absolute morality. It could be that one, God updates his laws from time to time, or two, that we don't actually know what God's laws are, and as a consequence, our conception of these objective laws are relative to our epistemic state, our knowledge of the world. These positions are, as we'll expand upon later, the only really viable theistic explanations as to why the holy books explicitly endorse acts that we now consider reprehensible, such as slavery. Thus, if I've understood him correctly, Fry is effectively saying that we're all in the same boat, suffering the same relativistic waves, and that we need only look at our grandparents, be them religious or not, to recognise this fact. And indeed, the empirical evidence very much agrees with him. Consider, for instance, the natural phenomena of homosexuality. Between 2002 and 2018, the acceptance of homosexuality has skyrocketed the world over. In the UK, it's increased by 12%, in the US and South Korea, by an astonishing 19%. And for every one accepting Kenyan in 2002, there now stands 14. Indeed, in less than a generation, our views on this one topic alone have significantly altered. Further still, the aforementioned study found that in 22 of 34 countries surveyed, younger adults are significantly more likely than their older counterparts to say that homosexuality should be accepted by society. This difference was most pronounced, the authors continue, in South Korea, where 79% of 18 to 29 year olds say that homosexuality should be accepted by society, compared with only 23% of those 50 and older. And so when Fry says, So the idea of the culture is a false one. There is no the culture. He's absolutely correct. Our culture, like every other culture, with or without a religious component, is not some static entity that's been preserved over generations. No, it's relative to epistemic and socio-economic circumstances. And when we adapt, when our views change, the next generation of the religious are essentially forced to reinterpret their scripture to survive. Indeed, to give just one instance, despite acceptance of homosexuality going up in Kenya by 1,400% in a generation, the vast majority of Kenyans are still religious, and hence we're witnessing religious moral relativism. Anyhow, let's have Fry continue. What religion has been brilliant at, and it's needed to be, but so has science, is redefining what God is. What God was in 1400, it was cap God was capable of being remarkable things. He was answerable for everything, and we worshipped him for it. A couple of hundred years later, a few things had been taken away from him, and we could answer for travelling the world and knowing it and uh, discovering how the stars actually were not holes in a black cloth, but maybe were celestial objects uh, with the, you know, and then a few hundred years later. And similarly, science, we use the word cosmos. Well, cosmos used to mean a very small sphere of the, the you know, a section of the, of, the, of the solar system. And now it's some infinite thing. And there may indeed be dozens of them, millions of them. Who knows, according to string theory and quantum theory and all kinds of Schrodinger's number and all the rest of it, that everything is redefined in each generation. So what is left that is absolute? And this is where religion has an argument with intellectual progress, because it wants to hang on to something that it believes is eternal and, and, and permanent and utterly always true. But there is no such thing. To give another illustration of Fry's point, consider Genesis 2.18, where God says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. This verse, among many others, has been the justification for untold misogyny throughout Abrahamic history. To stick to Christianity alone, since this is the religion that Peterson tends to favour, let's read the words of one of the most revered and influential church fathers, St. Augustine. If it were not the case that woman was created to be man's helper specifically for the production of children, then why would she have been created as a helper? Was it so that she might work the land with him? No, because there did not yet exist any such labour for which he needed a helper, and even if such work had been required, a male would have made a better assistant. 
One can also posit that the reason for her creation as a helper had to do with the companionship she could provide for the man, if perhaps he got bored of his solitude. Yet for company and conversation, how much more agreeable is it for two male friends to dwell together than a man and a woman? If it is necessary for one of the two people living together to rule and the other to obey so that an opposition of wills does not disturb their peaceful cohabitation, then nothing is missing from the order we see in Genesis direct to this restraint. For one person was created before, the other afterwards, and most significantly, the latter was created from the former, the woman from the man. And nobody wants to suggest, does he, that God, if he so willed, could only make a woman from a man's side, and yet he couldn't create a man as well. I cannot think of any reason for woman's being made as man's helper if we dismiss the reason of procreation. Now, this is just a tiny sprinkle of Augustine's contempt for females, but he isn't alone in his thoughts. No, the history of religion is a history of misogyny. As another example, here's a few words from perhaps the most famous and celebrated Christian philosopher of all time, Saint Aquinas. For good order would have been wanting in the human family if some were not governed by others wiser than themselves. So by such a kind of subjugation, woman is naturally subject to man, because in man, the discretion of reason predominates. And to give just one more example, and honestly I could do this for days straight, here's a piece from Martin Luther, delivered by a contemporary theologian. But then one moment, Luther says, uh, why are uh, girls sooner mature than boys? That's his question. And he says, it's easy, because weeds grow faster than roses. Uh, well, I got four daughters. They had it with Luther ever since then. Indeed. Trust the arrogance of men to so readily discount the wisdom of women. Misogyny, of course, still permeates within society, and especially religious society, but Christians these days tend to interpret Genesis in a vastly different way to their predecessors, and so once again we have a clear instance of religious moral relativism. Let's get back to Fry. The morality... You know, I mean, I did a debate with Christopher Hitchens, actually, about the Catholic Church and, and the people mm -hmm. defending it when, when we attacked the, their attitude towards child sex scandals, said, well, but in the 1960s, it wasn't such a big sin. And it, what, that is actually true. But it's not true coming from a Catholic whose whole point is that they are eternally true, that their morality is as true now as it was when St. Peter founded the church, that, that their enemy is people like me who are relativists, who say that there is no absolute morality, but that things change according to situation, circumstance, and knowledge. And so that is true of God. God alters every day. He adds a little bit of a quality here, or she does, and takes away another bit. Now no longer responsible for disease and no longer responsible for earthquakes, but may be responsible for something else. But it's a shrinking kingdom. Um, and so the idea of there being an absolute and an eternal, it just doesn't seem to square with the way we have developed over the, certainly over history, which is to say over the last 5,000 years, since we've been able to write things down. Before that, we can only judge how and who we were according to objects and artifacts and architecture. All right, so we've already taken a look at religious moral relativism in relation to the status of women and homosexuals, but let's now consider perhaps the most obvious case of religious moral relativism, the fact that the holy books explicitly endorse slavery. Shall be beaten with many stripes. Shall be beaten with many stripes. Now many signifies a great many. 40, 100, 150 lashes. That's scripture. Today, pretty much no Christian upholds slavery, and further still, they insist that the slavery of the Bible is strictly good slavery, you know, indentured servitude that was totally and entirely volitional. Slavery in the Hebrew culture was volitional. It was voluntary means of working off debt. It was not perpetual is the other thing worth pointing out. Uh, so it didn't transcend generations. It's not that slavery was endorsed by the Bible, it's that slavery is universal among human civilization until it, modern it, times. But it, if somebody had lost themselves to debt, it was basically like a type of bankruptcy law. They would enter into that voluntarily. Now I've debunked this apologetic sophistry in another video, and it really is grotesque sophistry. 
but for the purpose here, it's only necessary to recognize that contemporary Christians interpret verses that explicitly endorse slavery in a radically different way to their predecessors. For instance, these following verses unfortunately came in very handy for pro-slavery theists. Numbers 31, verse 17 to 18, commands that the spoils of wars are to be dealt with as follows. Kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that have known a man by lying with him. But all the women children who have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Gee, I wonder why. And Leviticus 25, verse 44 through 46, states that foreigners can be bought, sold, and passed down as inheritance, and that so too can their children. Further still, the New Testament offers no explicit condemnation of slavery, but in fact reassures it. For example, Ephesians 6, verse 5 states, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. And 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 states, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. But today, verses like these are pretty much ignored by Christians, being hand-waved away as something that theologians have adequately dispensed with. But again, all that is necessary for Fry's point is to recognise that God's categorical, immutable, divine laws resemble moral relativism in all but name. Now, whereas the moral relativists can be somewhat sympathetic of what we'd consider immoral practices of our ancestors by respecting that they were a product of their time and circumstances, this sympathy cannot be extended to the religious, since, as Fry puts it, It's not true coming from a Catholic whose whole point is that they are eternally true, that their morality is as true now as it was when St Peter founded the church. So let's dot the I's and cross the T's. When we wish to defend our own culture, or object to another culture, we can do so through two broad methods. On the one hand, we can appeal to a hypothetical imperative that we, or our interlocutor, holds. For instance, we could say, look, given that we, or the culture we're referring to, has the goal of X, it is scientifically, objectively the case that we, or they, ought to do Y. This is a perfectly sufficient way to justify our culture or critique another, but it's not, as Peterson said, off. Let's say higher value. And on the other hand, a second way we can defend our culture or object to another is by appealing to a categorical imperative. For instance, we could say, look, there exists an immutable eternal law that we must all do X unconditionally. Now, if you don't believe in categorical imperatives, then this option isn't open to you. But even if you believe in religious morality, then, per Fry's response, in light of empirical evidence, it's clear that you still don't have this option. Because there is no the culture. Indeed, even just a glance at history reveals that religious morality changes over generations, and thus it's relative, and not just relative to exegesis. Now, be it relative due to God changing his mind, which renders all of morality as merely grovelling at the whims of a divine dictator, or be it relative due to epistemic discovery, that is, to give an example, that we thought slavery was perfectly moral for centuries on the basis that the good book incessantly endorses it, but only discovered later that it isn't, and further still, we might well discover in the future that actually slavery is okay, the result on both horns is effectively the same. The charge of not having access to this form of higher value applies to the religious and irreligious alike, and thus all frameworks are equalised. An objection that affects all worldviews is no more a problem for one worldview than it is another. Or to put this another way, when the Christian says, look, I can defend my culture because I have a set of categorical imperatives, we can say one of two things. On the epistemic horn, we can say, do you now? How can you be so sure you're interpreting the words correctly, given that your predecessors got it so catastrophically wrong on slavery and the status of women and homosexuals? That's some faith you have, I must say. And on the ontological horn, we can similarly say, do you now? How can you be so sure that God hasn't changed his mind, given that he did so before on slavery and the status of women and homosexuals? That's some faith you have, I must say. So basically, if I've understood Fry correctly, and in any case I would say this myself, religious morality is a scam. The notion that religious morality, be it Christian, Hindu or what have you, is eternal and absolute, is arguably the most successful myth of all time, but the slightest knowledge of history enables one to escape the belly of the beast. Yet where does this leave us in terms of morality? 
Well, I personally think that Peterson has barked up the right tree here. But I've looked for what might be regarded as eternal verities in the moral domain. So let me put a few forward. Yeah. Um, the beautiful is more valuable than the ugly. Yeah. Yep. Truth, truth is to be sought after in opposition to falsehood. As Peterson and others have compellingly argued since the time of Darwin, our psyche didn't evolve in a vacuum. Just as natural selection has etched the serpent motif into our psyche as a leviathan of the ages, so too has nature etched in us, or at least the vast majority of us, a set of values that can, indeed, be described as something of higher value than those we make up on the spot. We are, after all, a social species that's been sculpted by nature to survive through reciprocity. Morality isn't an arbitrary bug, no, it's an evolved feature. Jeremy Bentham correctly identified, by my lights at least, that nature has placed humankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, suffering and pleasure, and that it is for them alone to point out what we ought to do. And it's my thesis that when a theist is pressed as to why she's so eager to dance to God's laws, it will, at base, come down to her serving her sovereign masters of suffering and pleasure. And in light of this, God and his laws is rendered to a mere potential fact about the world that empirically stands or falls like any other fact. If it is the case that the God of Abraham exists, then following his laws is indeed what we ought to do, given our ingrained hypothetical goal of maximising our well-being. But if it is not the case that the God of Abraham exists, then Judaism, Christianity and Islam are, as Hitchens pronounced, absolute poison. They are the fangs of the serpent. But I appreciate that I'm getting quite ahead of myself now, and so I'll reel it in. Peterson and Fry's conversation was, I repeat, an extremely fruitful and fascinating one that I highly recommend, and I hope I've constructively added to it here. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and YouTube members. I shall be sending out the tankards of truth within the next few days, and so please look out for an email. Much love.